share. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time to join our panel discussion today. My name is Elaine Kwok. I am the Director of Marketing at Peak Power. And if you're not familiar with us, at Peak Power, what we're doing is we're making power plants obsolete. We are a team of energy nerds that develop software for the real estate sector. Our tech transforms commercial buildings and industrial facilities from energy consumers into energy resources in a new decentralized electricity system. This means cleaner, more reliable, and more affordable electricity. We're powering the clean energy revolution. Today, we have a fantastic group of guests that will be discussing the future of CNI with FERC 2222. If you have any questions during the discussion, you can drop them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the, of the Zoom screen, and you can also upvote people's questions. What we'll do is at the end of the discussion, we're gonna collect the most upvoted questions and they will take up the Q&A portion following the panel discussion. So um, if you have any questions at all, Jonathan and I are here to answer you, so you can drop them in the chat below. Um, and before we start, we have a question uh, or a few questions for the on audience. So I'm just popping up the poll now. Please take the time to uh, let us know. Is everyone seeing the questions? <laughs> Thank you. Now I'm starting to see the questions, the answers come in. And for those of you who may not be, who may not uh, know, DERs does stand for Distributed Energy Resources. And we will get more into that during the during the discussion. Oh, okay. All right, we have about 75 people, 75% 75 of the people participated. And here are the results. So what are the biggest hurdles that you see in the development of DERs? Regulatory issues. So we have great people to talk about that today and cost, absolutely. What is clean energy on your list of priorities? So quite a few of you have net zero goals. Um, a few of you have no goals, but a roadmap, or sorry, goals, but no roadmap. Um, trying to balance environmental initiatives with costs, definitely what we're seeing at peak power every day. And all about offering costs, also something we're seeing quite a bit. And the main driver, cost savings, resiliency, and emissions. Oops, sorry. I thought I was sharing that. Neck and neck. All right, so I would, I am very pleased to introduce our uh, moderator today, who is Archie Adams. Archie, please take it away. Yeah, thanks, Elaine. Uh, and welcome to everybody. I uh, appreciate the responses to the poll, and it's helpful to see uh, what what's driving interest in bringing you here today. Um, so we have an excellent panel, and I'll, I'll start with a quick introduction on them. Uh, we have Ariel Horowitz, uh, Senior uh, Program Director with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, and then Pete Fuller, Founder and Principal of Autumn Lane Energy Consulting. Um, so I'll ask you guys just to say a, a few words about your background and starting with Ariel. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ariel Horowitz. Um, I'm, a, I'm a senior director at the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. For those that don't know us, we're an economic development corporation in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And our role is really um, to help accelerate the Commonwealth's path towards net zero by 2050. Uh, and build a thriving net zero compliant economy. Um, I oversee our work on clean transportation market development, grid related issues and tech to market. 
Um, and I'm just really excited to chat about um, sort of how a wider range of DERs can participate in some of our uh, our wholesale markets going forward under this new new scheme. Uh, thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Pete Fuller, Autumn Lane Energy Consulting, um, independent one-man shop. Um, the first half of my career, I worked in a utility uh, environment here in the northeastern United States, um, doing pretty standard engineering, planning, resource planning, power supply kind of stuff. Um, second half of my career was with an independent power producer, uh, or a couple of them, uh, working in the ISO uh, RTO space, again, primarily in the Northeastern US. Um, towards the end of that, um, I got involved with a lot of uh, um, the new technologies and, and the, the clean energy transformation um, as we were trying to, to implement it from the, from the merchant IPP space. And um, now in the third half of my career, um, I'm trying to help out companies all across the, the spectrum of the, uh, the energy space to um, to find that that interface between um, the policy goals that the states and and many corporates and others have with how the uh, ISO RTO markets work, so that's that's what I'm up to these days. Thank you both. I'm excited to have you uh, and hear your thoughts. Um, so just a, a little bit of background. Uh, I want to recognize that we have a, a wide array of people on here, and that some of the folks coming from the uh, commercial industrial spaces don't live and breathe energy and aren't quite as familiar with these terms. Uh, so just starting with some definitions. Uh, the first is a distributed energy resource. Um, so uh, typically uh, this is referring to a smaller decentralized uh, grid connected uh, physical or virtual asset that's connected at the, at the distribution level as opposed to um, you know, a, a larger centralized power plant um, that sort of dominates our market today. Uh, some examples, uh, you know, rooftop solar, uh, wind, uh, battery energy storage, EVs and EV chargers. Um, and you can imagine these kind of connected to a building um, within, in, a, in Massachusetts, the National Grid or Eversource uh, Distribution Network. Uh, second key term is FERC Order 2222. Um, it's football season, maybe sounds like a football play call, um, but uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, um, uh, sets orders guiding how energy markets uh, will operate. And this order 2222 is particularly interesting to us and our space uh, because it opens these energy markets to, uh, to distributed energy resources. So energy storage um, and PV being allowed to play in the larger uh, field. Um, and this is gonna mean that, uh, that these projects um, are able to participate in the ISO New England grid and energy market um, as a, sort of a different uh, and additional revenue stream uh, potential. Um, so, we're going to be discussing what that looks like for the CNI space and commercial real estate um, opportunities and challenges. Um, so, I wanted to start the discussion uh, with Pete and uh, thinking about his background at a um, sort of a ISO level. Um, can you speak, Pete, to uh, to ISO New England, um, their compliance with this order, and uh, what that's going to look like over the coming years? Uh, sure. Thanks, Archie. Thanks uh, to you and Elaine for the chance to be here today. Um, you know, uh, I think Order 2222 um, in ISO New England and elsewhere um, really is, um, it can be viewed as, you know, just a, another extension of another one you didn't throw in here, Order 841, uh, which opened markets or, or attempts to open markets to energy storage resources. Um, but Order 2222 really, I think, represents a, a, even a more fundamental shift in where the, the, the grid is going in terms of the, like you said, the small nature, the distributed nature. Uh, and that's, you know, I, I wish one of the, uh, the, the uh, potential responses in, in Elaine's opening poll was um, mindset, mind shift. Because as you said, we're, we're used to large centralized power systems, centralized power stations, um, the ISOs, the RTOs are used to controlling them fairly closely. And with DERs, we're, we're beginning to see the tension uh, between those things of um, wanting to maintain reliability, give the RTOs what they need in terms of, of being able to manage the system, but at the same time, recognizing that um, the, the system is becoming more decentralized, more atomistic, 
and I think a different mindset is going to be required. So um, I, I apologize if I didn't get into any specifics there, Archie, um, and I can dig deeper on, on any one of the RTOs, but I think that's sort of my, my opening thought on the, the, the real challenge of 2222 and DERs in general is getting people to think about a decentralized system as opposed to a centralized system. Yeah, certainly a challenge. Ariel, can you speak to uh, maybe a little bit more, more local um, in, in Massachusetts um, and uh, how the uh, electrical distribution companies, National Grid and Eversource, are looking at this uh, sort of coming wave of DERs? Yeah, so I think, you know, in the Commonwealth, we, we have a, a very wide range of programs that resources on the distribution system can participate in. Um, and what we've seen is that there is a significant range of complexity for what it takes both for um, the resource owners to participate and sort of gain revenue from those programs and for the utilities to be able to implement those programs in the first place. So Eversource and National Grid had both included investments to support FERC 2222 compliance in their grid modernization plans that they have currently pending with the Department of Public Utilities. Um, so that's a lot of sort of regulatory uh, jargon and terminology there, but essentially what that means is that they, they asked for the IT infrastructure that they would need to, to monitor how their customers are participating in the wholesale markets. And the regulator um, in the Commonwealth uh, that oversees their spending essentially told them we're going to punt this issue. We're not going to consider those investments right now. We're going to delay that until later. Um, what that means is that even apart from kind of the theoretical mindset shift that he was talking about or sort of the tariff changes that would define in concept how people can participate in these markets, there's an entire separate set of implementation issues around, again, the actual IT infrastructure, the actual metering, the ability to collect data and transmit that data um, from the customer to the utility up to ISO New England that is going to have to all be worked out. Separately, I think there's a lot of questions around what some of the impacts of these, um, of distribution cited resources participating in some of the wholesale markets is going to look like, because there are um, some sort of traditional peak shaving or demand response type um, participation patterns that, that uh, Eversource and National Grid are really comfortable with. But if you look at the markets on a you know, day by day, or even moment by moment basis, there's all sorts of different swings in pricing that could lead to resources on the distribution grid acting in ways that are very different from how they would currently act based on just customers sort of seeking to use their resources to provide energy services you know, on site to their own. Um, for their own business purposes or office purposes or residential purposes. And so that's something that I think the utilities are still trying to wrap their heads around what what they what to expect there and how to react to it. Absolutely, kind of shifting from uh, uh, the market being focused on these large centralized generators to this much more distributed sort of hodgepodge of resources that are all contributing um, and the, the challenge of managing those. Um, Pete, can you share thoughts about how um, how these RTOs are are looking at this, um, and maybe what they're what they're doing and thinking about for preparing? Um, well, I will say that you know I I think the um, you know Ariel is exactly right that you know in addition to the the sort of mindset that I'm worried about, there are a ton of blocking and tackling issues, just business processes and and the day to day complexity of getting things done that absolutely needs to get resolved. Um, I would say that, you know, of the RTOs that I've been dealing with, ISO New England, New York ISO, PJM primarily, um, you know, I think they've they've taken FERC uh, orders, you know, in, in uh, um, you know, very sincerely and, and put in really good effort to um, make, uh, you know, make the changes to their wholesale markets that will be necessary for um, the smaller resources in, in aggregation to play. Um, I think, it's instructive that um, in all of those uh, proceedings that I've been involved with, there's kind of been two tracks. Uh, one is the, the standard stuff that I, at least, and you know, people in my world are, are very comfortable with. We talk with the ISO, 
ISO. We talk with other peers about how this stuff is going to work. We write the rules. But there's a parallel track that all of the RTOs uh, have spent a lot of time on, which is really just with the utilities and perhaps a, you know, an advisory group of, of some of the industry folks of just how are we going to make this work? How are we going to process a request? How are we going to register it? Who's going to talk to who? Where are the, the checkpoints, the breakpoints, the decision points? Who analyzes what? So it, it's that kind of you know, blocking and tackling um, that is, um, has gotten a great deal of focus and effort. And um, you know, I think it, it, people have done a, a good job in uh, putting those things into, into place. But I will also say that life being what it is, um, I fully expect that the first year or two dot, 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 uh, there will be a lot of growing pains as people try new things and aggregate in new ways and test these processes. And uh, until you know, the utilities and the ISO get, uh, get reasonably comfortable with it. But I, I think those kind of issues are, are going to be the big implementation challenge for the most part, and there are some notable ex exceptions, but I'll not get into them. The the frameworks that the RTOs have put in place, you know, within their own markets, I think are are really going to be, uh, you know, quite robust. But it's getting projects through the process and actually into those, and being able to to operate in ways that don't conflict with whatever they're doing, you know, at the utility level, at the distribution level, at the state level. Certainly. And I, I don't want to scare people off uh, who are you know, unfamiliar with this and, and hearing about all these challenges, uh, because it is a fantastic opportunity um, for the uh, CNI space um, and, and sort of scaling down projects from utility scale into, uh, uh, you know, more local, uh, sort of in your town next door, you drive past it on the way to work kind of thing. Um, so uh, thinking about that um, and, and the project life cycle, one of the first things that happens and one of the biggest challenges is interconnection. Um, it's a challenge for, for solar developers, for energy storage, um, and I know the utilities are uh, working on it, but there's certainly a, a backup in the queue um, in terms of getting resources onto the grid. Um, Ariel, can you share any thoughts you have about um, how, uh, how interconnection is going to, to shift um, and what, how uh, distribution companies can kind of support uh, and prepare for that? Yeah, um, I, I think sort of the key thing here to remember is that the interconnection process was really built around the idea that interconnecting customers were going to be kind of odd ducks. That you know most most customers on the distribution system were um, sort of standard load customers. There's a process for connecting new load, but especially in Massachusetts, you know we're um, a, a state that has most of the, the buildings that exist have existed for a long time. Um, and so sort of thinking through a new customer comes in and says, hey, I want something different from than what the utility is able to give me right now. Um, it was built to kind of be a, a one-off situation that could be handled one by one. Obviously, we're now in a situation where our decarbonization policies, among other uh, factors are driving a ton of interconnection requests and the utility processes and the governing tariffs are not built out for that. The staffing isn't built out for that. The tools aren't built out for that. Um, and again, the, the governing tariff was not developed with that in mind. Um, the climate law that the Massachusetts State Legislature just passed earlier in the summer uh, made a really big change to how we think about um, planning the distribution system by creating this grid modernization advisory council that's getting stood up. And I think that is indicative of a mindset shift again around this question of this is now the norm. Solar interconnection requests, storage interconnection requests, electric vehicle interconnection requests. These are things we're going to be seeing, you know, thousands of new customer adoptions every year that the utilities are going to have to be um, both more efficient and to a certain extent more proactive in preparing for what these interconnection requests are going to be. 
I do think that the customer experience will get better over time, both because the utilities are, are going to have to resource those processes better and have already started asking permission to do so. But um, I will say that the customers are not always going to be 100% happy with what um, decisions get made in part around um, the idea that if you're asking for freedom to operate 100% under your discretion, you get to choose exactly when do you charge a battery, when do you discharge a battery, when do you charge your car. If you have 100% discretion over that, the utility has to be able to serve that 100% um, of the time. If you're willing to accept um, restriction on an operating schedule, then that's something that might yield a significant cost savings. But again, it also comes with opportunity costs. So I think there are, you know, we're, when we're talking about building out physical infrastructure um, to continue to serve these resources and provide safe and reliable power, not just to somebody who's trying to participate in markets, but also to their neighbor, the goal is that folks can do everything that they want to do um, and can benefit from all these programs that are being put into place and help the Commonwealth meet our departmentization goals, for example. Um, and that that can be done in a way that's sort of equitable and maintains reliability. There's just a lot there to balance. Yeah, certainly. Hey, uh, hey Archie, can I, can I just ahead. follow on a, a quick point um, and, and picking up your point? I, I'm not at any way trying to discourage anybody from, from taking this up, but uh, but I also want people to go into it with open eyes. But I think, you know, the interconnection process processes that, that Ariel just described um, are a case in point or a couple of cases in point. I mean, a few years ago, trying to interconnect solar was a big deal and it was fraught with all kinds of, of glitches. That's become pretty smooth. Um, storage, the, we're beginning to see the sand work its way out of the gears and that's becoming a smoother process. So I think we're, we've been learning, the utilities have been learning, but it's, it's about building the process, building the staffing uh, to be able to do that. So um, I, I, it's just a word of, of caution that if you're the first one in the door, don't expect it to move, you know, absolutely smoothly. That's a great but there, there really is a lot of room for just kind of, you know, I, I'm sure most of the folks on this webinar either, you know, have a Salesforce process or some other kind of customer relationship management tool. Like that's something that it would really help for the utilities to, to have the ability to invest in kind of the modern software tools to be able to, you know, ticket tracking, like there are best practices on these types of things that, again, are implementation issues, um, sort of meat and potatoes day to day that are going to make the customer experience a lot better, kind of apart from these electric sector heavy questions around um, cost allocation and how do you think about um, policy-driven upgrades and things along those lines? Yeah, it's a great point on sort of uh, improving the process. I, I know having worked on some of these projects in the past, um, there's sort of an unknown timeline of when, how long interconnection takes, what the actual cost will be uh, to the customer and the project, really the project. Um, but it, yeah, we do expect that to be to improve and uh, products like storage that actually do offer something back to the grid as opposed to just sort of the, the solar, which has production that, um, you know, is is generally predictable, but does have its ups and downs. Um, hopefully, it will be be streamlined as well. Um, and excited to see that. Um, those are sort of the mid range. Then we'll get to even smaller ones with, for example, bidirectional charging and, and uh, uh, even smaller scale distributed resources. Um, want to shift and and again thinking about the commercial real estate audience here. Um, can you talk about what how uh, larger scale electrification uh, will impact our grid um, and particularly New England and um, you know, I think there's no way around thinking about heat pumps here. I'll leave that to anybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, I think as we start seeing some of these larger commercial um, building electrification projects come on, it, there's just a ton of energy there. And the, we don't have a lot of operational experience with um, what the load shape looks like for a commercial building um, different different use cases that has all electric heating or all electric water heating. Um, and so thinking about 
what does that look like in the summer? What does it look like in the shoulder season? What does it look like, or you know, spring and fall when you don't have a ton of heating load necessarily or a ton of cooling load? What does it look like in the middle of winter, in the dead of winter when you might have a cold snap? Um, one of the big questions is how uh, customers are going to be sizing these systems. How do you figure out the heating load that you need and then size a heat pump, a commercial heat pump um, system to meet that? Um, and then how, how does the utility sort of build out for that? So there is cost there to get a bigger pipe, but then there's also this sort of question of, um, you know, what does that look like for traditional demand response? What does that look like for potentially other types of programs? How opportunistic can these sorts of systems be in jumping on other revenue opportunities when you do need to be able to maintain, obviously, building comfort as the first and foremost? I, I guess I would, would um, build on that and say that, you know, for people in commercial real estate or frankly, in, in your home, um, that as you think about electrification, if you're actually doing an overhaul and replacing equipment and, you know, electrifying a former uh, combustion use or, or building new and putting in heat pumps and so on and so forth, um, I think that, that conversation, that discussion really should uh, look at um, the facility not just as a load, not just as a, a passive endpoint on the utility system or the grid, but how will you interact with that grid? What, what kind of controls can you put in place to manage peaks, to manage you know, on-off uh, things, to be able to provide uh, resilience back to the grid? You know, none of these are simple questions. I don't think there's any silver bullet or or simple checklist, but but making sure that that the the focus is not just within the fence line or within the building or within the panel, but it's like how do we interact with the rest of the world? Because the the whole idea of 2222 and DERs, um, and frankly, what you guys at Peak Power do is where's the value to the grid of this, this end use of this, this otherwise load, what can we do that provides value back? And frankly, how can we monetize that? And how can we make it more, uh, more valuable to the, the owner, the investor who's, who's putting that in for their building comfort, for their people, uh, for their processes, but ultimately how can they uh, earn money off of that by providing additional value outwards? Absolutely, kind of tight with that, that mindset shift. And uh, we've, again, talked about these challenges, but it's really a, a shift from uh, the load being just sort of a, a one-way interaction with the grid to a two-way and, and the opportunities that presents uh, both uh, for the utility and managing that and balancing a larger grid. And then also for the facility uh, as an opportunity to, uh, to add additional revenues um, and help uh, both balancing their uh, electricity bills and then also what they can do back toward the grid. Um, yeah, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, so I guess, you know, as we're starting to uh, uh, think ahead, can you share thoughts on what um, folks in commercial real estate can can do now? Um, say, say a building owner or somebody with a facility load, um, where should they be looking? What should they be looking at? Um, and, you know, um, any good places to start? Yeah, I mean, this again is one of those implementation issues that uh, for me, like the, the one thing that, that folks should do now is if in the event that you have any kind of trenching going on, just put in conduit. Um, I, I think one of the things that we've seen is that if you already have a resource, like you're getting a battery for some other reason um, and uh, you can justify the entire capital cost, installation cost on um, one particular revenue stream, like um, demand charge mitigation, then there's a ton of opportunity to go in and, uh, again, opportunistically sort of benefit from these other types of programs or market participation opportunities, um, or if you're putting in EV chargers as an employee or anything along those lines. Um, if you're looking at these market opportunities and then trying to back justify the cost of putting in a resource, it can be difficult to get there 
they depending on sort of where the building is in its life cycle. And if you're under development, you start thinking about it early, you start thinking about what's the level of electrical service that I need, make sure that I get all my conduit put in so that I don't have to trench it again later. Or if I'm already trenching that I think ahead about um, what type of actual service, you know, where, where on my built building footprint or my parcel do I need there to be electrical service, then there can be a ton of cost savings around that. If you have sort of a fully complete building and you're going back and looking and saying, you know, I want to initialize a project where I'm putting in EV charging, that's something where there can be really surprisingly high costs, um, both for the utility service um, front of the meter side, sort of the utility owned infrastructure, as well as for on the customer's premises, actually laying down that, that conduit and getting electrical service where you need it to be. Uh, Mass CC and trenching, love it. <laughs> so, I, I mean, and, and uh, this is certainly not news to anybody in the commercial real estate space, but I know there's there's often a disconnect between the building owner, the building tenant, and you know who does what and how that all fits together. But ignoring that, that distinction for a minute, um, I think to Ariel's point a little bit, if you're just uh, wh wherever you are uh, in you know the cycle of the building or or whatever is think about what an all electric system would look like. What would you need for that? Maybe you don't do it all today, but like Ariel said, put in the conduit, leave plenty of space for additional panels. Um, think about where the batteries are gonna go. All of those sort of planning things are going to become important. And I, for one, living in effectively an all electric house, which we were able to build a couple of years ago, um, I, I can't see us ending up anywhere other than, you know, virtually 100% electric buildings at some point. They come soon, may come late, but um, planning for that and preparing for that, um, I think, is probably the, the, the one thing that, that I would just encourage everybody to do. Yeah, I think uh, an example of Pete to build on that, um, and I should point back to the CEC, is um, thinking about a residential system, um, you know, people uh, in for example, commercial real estate buildings, um, when something like a large piece of equipment fails, um, often you're looking at what options you have to purchase and install. And if you haven't done research uh, leading up to that, you're probably gonna end up with a, uh, a cheaper option. Um, unfortunately, that, that might lock you into fossil fuels for another 20, 30 years. Um, so understanding and doing the research on uh, what electrification of a building will take and how to support that. Um, obviously at Peak Power, we are, are managing new storage projects um, and how storage and solar could potentially work on a site. Um, I know that a lot of building codes are now requiring uh, consideration of that and are also being built to uh, with, with panels that can kind of be ready for that system. And, you know, I think the other thing to be aware of around this is that, especially in the past you know, year to 18 months, there's a ton of policy, both at the state level and now at the federal level to support people in undertaking these projects. So you know, in the Commonwealth, we now have it that the mass save energy efficiency programs um, that are also run through the utilities, they have emission targets that they have to hit and they have you know, billion dollar a year budgets to hit those targets. Um, they're looking for savings. So it's, they want customers to reach out to them and say, you know, I'm considering doing a project. Is there a way that I can scope that project so that I'm delivering, you know, energy savings, megawatt savings or megawatt hour savings to you and you can provide back to me a rebate or support on this project. Um, and then obviously the Inflation Reduction Act has just a lot in there um, for, um, for folks to adopt all of these different types of resources. And I think, you know, I'm not a tax professional, this is not tax advice, but one thing that, that um, uh, stood out to me as notable about that piece of legislation is that it um, modified what counts as an eligible project cost for investment and tax credit purposes to include interconnection costs. So, you know, to really think about when you're going um, through the, the project planning process, um, there have been a, a lot of policy changes and just, you know, talk, reaching out to folks that can help you understand the details of those policy changes, some of which are still sort of being implemented um, at the federal level or even at the state level to get projects to the point where they're really appealing because that's the, that's the goal of that policy. 
Yeah, certainly. I think if we did that poll again uh, that we started with, most people would probably be answering interconnection is the, the key issue here. Um, but yeah, that, thanks for bringing up the, the um, storage ITC as well. It's, good. it's a huge uh, boost um, to, to what we're doing and understand that the uh, federal government as well as uh, the Commonwealth is really incentivizing these types of projects because of the benefits that they provide to the grid and the customers. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see some uh, uh, savings coming up um, for folks. Um, all right, so I think uh, uh, shifting over to the Q&A session, um, I think we have one question in here. I don't know if uh, other folks are, are able to ask questions. Um, if you just type those into the, the Q&A box. Um, let's see, we have a question from Brad Swalwell um, regarding FERC and um, let's see, I think this is a, a pretty, pretty high level looking at how um, on the operational front, um, can you comment on how ISO and RTOs plan to coordinate load curtailment uh, for wholesale market purposes uh, with the utilities need to know about and managing curtailment and load swings in the distribution system? Um, yeah, definitely a, a great question. And open that up. Um, Pete, do you have any, anything to say on that one? Uh, I, I can take a first stab at it, Brad. Thanks very much. Good to, good to have you on the, the webinar today. Um, you know, I think this is this is one of those questions of, you know, it, in concept, in theory, you can lay out a process, but it, it's probably going to vary all over the place. Um, you know, for example, you know, you're asking how will the RTOs plan and coordinate curtailment, load curtailment, for market purposes with utilities need to know. So you take, for example, New York has been very direct about this um they're saying you know you're going to give us essentially economic offers with your der aggregations um and those offers and bids had better um include any of your obligations to the utility because we're going to operate on the basis of the, the bids you give us and there will be you know telemetry there will be other forms and means of communication but in terms of how the system is going to operate, uh, New York, I think, has been the most direct about this, that it's going to be up to the aggregator, the DER provider, to, uh, to tell NISO what kind of flexibility it has, taking into account whatever obligations you have to the utility. Um, the other you know, PJM New York and uh, uh, New England that I'm also familiar with, them, it, they haven't been quite as clear but I think the general principle holds that um, the, the expectation is that what you bring to the wholesale market is, for lack of a better term, net of whatever obligations you might have to your local utility or is, is cognizant of whatever limitations uh, have been put on you by your local utility. Um, so, you know, I think, I, I'm not sure that's totally responsive, um, but that's you know, that, that's sort of some thoughts on on how I think that management is generally intended to go. Yeah, thanks for weighing on that. Hope that that answers a, a fairly RTO specific question. Um, folks uh, can uh, chime in any questions about um, more on the CNI space. Um, happy to answer those. And uh, um, yeah, anything else? Uh, let's see. Um, Ariel, are you able to share anything about uh, sort of the Mass CDC's uh, outlook on, you know, we're going to have a whole bunch of offshore wind power um, coming in. Uh, obviously, that, that recent uh, bill uh, passed by the Commonwealth is going to be fantastic for, for that. Can you talk about how, um, how the Mass CDC is viewing it's going to be a, a massive source of power and, and what that's going to look like? Yeah, I mean, we're very excited about the offshore wind industry generally, um, as, is, as is the entire Commonwealth. Um, I, I think, you know, well, there's a couple of different aspects there. Um, one is that we know this is going to be a massive effort to build the industry um, that's necessary to deliver those projects, not just the developers themselves, but their um, sort of contractors, their supply chain, their workforce, and that's, um, we have programming sort of focused on all of those issues. The port development is going to be huge, similarly. 
Um, I think the other thing that we're seeing that may be relevant to, to this audience is um, people asking sort of how can they get a cut on the, you know, how can, how can I as a customer buy some of the offshore wind or sort of benefit from some of those um, projects coming online. Um, I think what, what we see at the moment is that the, I think there was like one side deal going on. Apart from that, you know, the projects are being procured um, on behalf of all the, the customers of the Commonwealth through um, the utilities. As that industry gets more mature, I think we're going to see a lot more sort of creative bilateral, multilateral deals with the developers, the ability for those wind farms to participate in other, you know, maybe even hydrogen or other types of um, uh, collaborations with other types of, of energy resources. Um, and that they'll also contribute, you know, to sort of cost certainty uh, around our energy markets. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of volatility in energy prices, both um, for heating and for electricity. And as we see more and more of our um, resource mix being made up by the offshore wind over the coming, you know, sort of 10, 15 years, um, a lot of that, you know, we're hoping that that, that cuts out a lot of that volatility um, in addition to, to reducing emissions. Yeah, and the profile of generation from offshore wind matches up very well with solar. Uh, excited to, to see those kind of uh, work well and also the generation, particularly in the cold, um, is helpful. Um, all right. Well, I don't think we've got too many questions from the audience. I think people are maybe maybe a little quieter today. Um, but I guess we can wrap up and, and ask the panelists to share um, just a, maybe a takeaway that you'd ask uh, the audience to um, to to take from uh, from this webinar. Sure. Um, I'm happy to start. I guess, and then I'll hand it over to Pete. Um, but I guess I, the main takeaway that I would love people to have is just that. Um, Again, the, the goal of all of these, you know, of FERC Order 2222, of all the policy in the Commonwealth, a lot of the policy at the federal level, is for customers to be able to participate in a clean energy transition, to be able to adopt these resources, to benefit from them, and provide benefits back. Um, and so, you know, there are resources here to help people with that adoption um, and, and to be proactive and to reach out, um, you know, to MassDC, to reach out to your utility um, with questions, um, to, you know, talk to experts. There's obviously a lot of kind of energy wonks or nerds in, in New England who think about this, um, you know, all day, every day. And, and really want to see these industries thrive. And we know that customers are going to need to do a lot. Um, and that these projects can be complicated. And so I would just encourage people, yeah, if whatever questions come up, um, to really reach out and be proactive and be vocal around what is working, what isn't working, and, and where people are running into issues in, in getting projects done. Yeah, I, I think I would um, echo that and say that, um, you know, as I said earlier, just as you're going through your day to day life um, and thinking about your HVAC system and your electric system, which everybody does all the time, of course. Um, but but to to realize that the way it always has been is not going to last. That that electrification is a thing, and in my mind, at least, it, it's it's inevitable. Um, again, it's not going to be next week, but over the course of decade or two or three, um, I think we're going to see tremendous transformation. And when you get that mindset, uh, as Ariel said, and, and as all this background policy stuff that we've been talking about in, indicates, the idea is not to simply be a consumer of that energy, but to, to interact and, and to use the, the energy uh, uh, you know, devices that exist in every home and every building um, in an interactive way. So, you know, we have communications have come light years to be able to, you know, talk back and forth with, with many devices, uh, computer capability, decision-making capability, analysis capability for, you know, for my thermostat to understand what's going on the grid out on the street and to react to that. That capability exists and will only grow over time. So for folks to think about that, you know, where that's going and 
as energy issues come up in their day-to-day -day life or in their work life to look at it through that lens that over time they'll be using more electricity uh, but also gaining more and more capability to uh, to use their their own on-site devices uh, to gain to add value to the system and to get paid for it thank you one other question came in. Um, this is uh, asking about if uh, typical tariff designs used for CNI customers will uh, prevail under Order 2022. Um, I think I can take a stab at that quickly and then give you guys one last shot. Um, but I think I'd expect to see greater time of use rates um, and maybe maybe more rates that are targeting coincident peaks, um, potentially the monthly one. Uh, I know that uh, in our space, looking at um, uh, the Eversource uh, T5 rate for large industrials out in Western Massachusetts. Those are, you know, huge, huge loads. They're almost like small towns. And those targeting um, targeting monthly peaks um, as a way to discourage that and actually as a great opportunity for energy storage. Um, anything else to add from uh, Pete and Ariel on that? Um, I, I think we are likely to see some type of, I mean, the so the word tariff, means a lot of different things depending on the context, right? So so in thinking about a rate schedule, um, I think we'll probably see some some types of adjustments, but there's a lot of tension um, between what do you do as a rate versus what do you do as a program? Um, because programs can be a little bit more dynamic or sort of responsive to changes in conditions as opposed to a rate schedule that's set in advance. Um, the other types of governing tariffs, you know, inter interconnection tariffs, um, line extension tariffs, um, those I think we would expect to see um, some updates to, I don't know, like they would, a complete rewrite, but so they will have to be updated over time as um, uh, both 2222 compliance and, and these other issues sort of continue to roll on. Yeah, I, I, I think um, in both respects that Ariel mentioned, you know, the rate schedules and, and other terms and so forth that, that utilities deal with, I think they're, they're destined to evolve just because the nature of, of what they're doing, what kind of services they're providing to customers um, will be changing. So I think, you know, to enable a lot of this um, two-way uh, interaction, um, we're already seeing, you know, some test tariffs in some places to try different things, time of use, different um, demand rates, um, just different kinds of things that that you know allocate costs and risks and benefits a little bit better. I, I'm I'm no you know distribution rate expert, but I'm quite certain those things are going to evolve over time. Thanks. Another one more question coming in. Um, we had two or three actions we want to see a, a distributed utilities. Uh, implement um, as we see the growth of acceleration, uh, growth of electrification accelerate, what would they be? Any uh, any advice to uh, to Eversource from National Grid? Um, I think they need a lot better software tools. Um, no offense to them, you know, it's an industry that's had a lot of difficulty around adopting um, sort of modern software tools for a variety of reasons. Um, but just being able to integrate, you know, the billing systems with the GIS systems with, and, and it helped them to be a lot more responsive. Again, there's a lot of um, operational issues around that type of thing and it's expensive. Um, but uh, we've, you know, we've come a long way in the ability to manage really large data sets um, and to do interesting things with those data sets. And the utilities have a lot of data um, that they could be doing really interesting things with. Um, so that would be one thing. Um, and then the, the other action that I would love to see them do is just really um, sort of staff up and become really um, uh, super excellent on the customer interaction side around um, folks that are reaching out to them with you know service requests, things along those lines. Again, I just think the pace uh, of, of those types of projects, they're gonna get so many requests that there, there just has to be a lot, a lot more staffing there. Yeah, I, I think those are excellent. The, the, the back office stuff, the, the data management stuff, um, billing, 
I recall one project I worked on a couple of years ago where the, the utilities answer to us was, well, we're going to have to do this manually every month. So we really can't handle a lot. So, you know, upgrading those systems and, and it, it goes back, you know, something Ariel said, you know, it, a lot has to do with their, their regulatory oversight is, is can, um, can the regulators see the value uh, looking forward in terms of these kinds of, of investments in back office equipment and software and resources and, and staff training and so forth. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done in that realm. Um, I guess the, another thing, and I, I think for the most part, utilities are, are starting to do this, but again, it, it comes back to that same question of cost recovery is much like I was advising building owners and, and tenants, if the if Eversource National Grid and others look at their system and the, what, what if everybody was fully electric? What would, what would our distribution system look like? I wager that it would look very different or, or substantially different. And so their, their ability to kind of get ahead of that, to leverage projects that they need to do anyway, you know, uh, they need to rebuild the distribution line because the highway is being moved or uh, you know, a substation is old and it needs to be replaced or upgraded. Trying to think ahead and, and right size the system you know, for a decade or two down the road is not a bad plan. It would be a great plan. A lot goes back to cost recovery and whether they can, can gain that. Um, but I think having that kind of forward looking plan and, and action to, um, to future proof their, their distribution systems um, would, be, would be fantastic. Absolutely. Um, and just uh, to wrap up on my end, I think uh, looking at, at this uh, really is a huge opportunity. Uh, we've talked again about challenges, but it's, it's really a massive opportunity to, uh, to sort of uh, additional sources of revenue and savings uh, for managing a building load. Um, so uh, exciting and a wave of DER is coming our way. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back to Elaine. So we do wanna, we had a couple of questions left, but I think we're running low on time. Um, so I wanted to thank all the panelists for such a lively discussion and to express our gratitude for your time today. Peak Power has made a donation in your honor to the Solutions Project. Uh, they are an organization that invests in community-based organizations and leaders who are removing political, financial, cult and cultural barriers to affordable clean energy through grant programs. They focus on equity and are serving those who are most impacted by climate change. Thank you as well to all of our attendees. Please be on the lookout for that post-webinar survey that's going to pop up and also in your email. We are going to be offering more webinars in the future. So any feedback you can give us would really help us create things that are impactful and useful to you. And I think that's it for us today. Thank you so much and have a great day, everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you.